You are watching With a Cup of Tea, the High Plains Book Awards edition, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings, Montana. Now here's our show. Welcome to This House of Books. Uh, we have with us today M. Mark Miller, who's a finalist for the High Plains Book Award. Um, and we're going to, he has a book we're going to talk about in a minute, but maybe first, uh, let's hear from you, Mark. Maybe you could tell us a little about yourself. Okay. Um, I grew up on a ranch uh, in the Jefferson River Valley near Silver Star, Montana. That's the southwest corner of the state. Uh, my ancestors settled in that part of the state in the gold rush era 150 years ago. So my roots run back in Montana. Um, I had a pretty typical, I guess, growing up for a ranch kid. I went to uh, uh, school in Twin Bridges, Montana, then went to the University of Montana and majored in journalism, uh, then took jobs as newspaper in newspapers in uh, Salt Lake City, and I just worked for the Tribune there and then uh, in, in Western Kentucky for a while. Uh, I went to graduate school and I got hooked on teaching. So I eventually wound up with a PhD and became a journalism professor for a while at the University of Wisconsin, most of my career at the University of Tennessee. In 2003, my wife wanted to take, take a job at Montana State University. And being a sweet man, I let her talk me into early retirement and we moved back to Montana. Uh, and one of the deal, deals on that was that I would try to, take, try to take up my lifelong dream of becoming a writer. So in 2003, I really started taking seriously the notion of writing uh, for popular audiences. So that's the precy of my life. Okay, well, that's uh, very good. So now you have a book uh, called Encounters in Yellowstone. Uh, the Nez Perce Summer of uh, 1877. Um, tell us about that book. That book uh, is a compilation of the stories of the several people who ran afoul of the Nez Perce in Yellowstone Park in the summer of 1877. Uh, the Nez Perce uh, had lived fairly peacefully on their reservation for a number of years. They uh, first encountered whites in the, when Lewis and Clark came through there and probably were instrumental in the survival of that expedition. They treated them very well and, as I said, lived peacefully uh, until the 1870s. There was very little conflict. Uh, and then it's kind of the classic story that gold was discovered on their land, which brought in uh, prospectors who were immediately followed by settlers who demanded that the Indians be put on reservations. And the army was sent to accommodate that request. Uh, conflict broke out and the Indians fled uh, eastward uh, across Idaho into Montana, had a bloody battle at, um, at the Big Hole, which you're probably familiar with. And then, uh, as they were fleeing, they, I think they were trying to avoid uh, the settled areas of Montana, particularly uh, Fort Ellis in Bozeman. So they decided to go through Yellowstone Park. And that was uh, where all of these stories that I gathered uh, came from. Uh, it was a very dramatic set of events, not very much covered by historians. They've tended to leave this uh, aside, I guess because it was um, uh, not very important in the politics or the military history of the area, but these were really dramatic human stories. Um, so in my earlier books, I, I collected stories of, of travel to Yellowstone Park, and uh, it occurred to me that I might put together a book of these uh, so I found everything I could find on first person accounts. That is, I wanted this to, to look at the original sources, which are scattered around, uh, a lot of them in newspapers, a lot of them published other places. 
So 15 or so accounts, and then my job was to braid this together into a single book. Uh, and that proved to be a, an interesting task uh, because, you know, every time the Indians would attack a group, the, 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 uh, the tourists would scatter. So all of a sudden, one story stood, broke into five or six stories. Uh, uh, further com complicating that is there were several parties of tourists in the bar. There weren't many people, but there were four or five groups. Uh, so it, it got to be a very complicated thing. So it took me a long time to put it together. Uh, but as I said, it's a very dramatic set of stories. It's uh, several of the stories most people or many Montanans will have heard. Uh, the most famous is Emma Cowan's story of her being taken captive by the, by the Nez Perce, uh, released in the middle of the park, uh, and then going on. Uh, her husband's story of waking up having, having been left for dead uh, is another one of those, a uh, very dramatic story. Another group of tourists in the park was, was the so-called Helena Party. Uh, they were attacked by the Indians and scattered. So that's, you know, these are stories of, you know, high adventure. And I, I thought that, that they were worth a, a book and something that had been neglected by uh, writers in the past. There's nobody's really tried to synthesize the, the whole set and write, write about them in detail. Yes, I, you know, I'm thinking that uh, uh, part of maybe what you're, you're basing this on uh, appeared in uh, the anthology Last Best Place um, that uh, uh, William Kittredge and Anna Smith put together uh, years ago. And uh, yeah, the Cowan story is in there, and that's probably the most famous yeah. of the stories. Emma Cowan is, is really kind of a simple character in my book. It's the thread that runs all the way uh, through. Uh, you know, the book fairly early picks up Emma Cowan um, kind of horning her way in on her brother's expedition to the park. He came along, he was going to go to the park with two of his friends. Uh, they stopped in Raidersburg, Montana, south, uh, south of Helena. And uh, she wanted to go. And so he accommodated her. All of a sudden, you know, they had a large expedition going through. And of course, then the book ends with, um, with Emma's trip um, from Helena, where she waited to, by, by the telegraph office for news of her husband, and her overnight ride to uh, the Paradise Valley, where her husband had been waiting when he was taken out of the park. So she's a very central character in this story. Uh, and then other stories kind of hang like Christmas ornaments around her story. Okay, so you've, you've uh, I mean, this is not simply nonfiction, it's creative nonfiction because you've woven together all these stories into one and, and were able to, to create some coherent whole out of it. Yeah, I tried hard to make these into stories that would be enjoyable reading. If you want to read, you know, interesting adventure stories, this is what I was aiming for. I don't think of myself as a historian. I think of myself as a, as a collector and teller of stories. Um, so I tried to use literary devices uh, foreshadowing and those kinds of things uh, to make this an interesting read. Uh, it's a fun balance to be writing narrative history like this and getting the facts straight and making it interesting and dramatic at the same time. Uh, I didn't realize when I began what a challenge that would be. Uh, so the book took longer than, than I expected it to. That's, uh, that's a, almost a, a definition of creative nonfiction, isn't it? I mean, it's really a, a, an excellent summary of what that genre is. And you base this on a lot of a lot of research. I mean, you've collected uh, more than 300 first-person accounts of people uh, going into the park before 1915. So it's it's well grounded in in uh, fact. Yeah, I was you know um, you know my first two books were anthologies, just stories collected and write prefaces, edit them, and put them together. In fact, I. 
when I wrote this, started this book, I thought that's what I'd do. The stories were just too desperate and too overlapping to make that work in a sensible book. That is getting several versions of the same events uh, and that wouldn't make a fun read. So I had to sit down and sort through those. I think of it as kind of like the Cubist paper painters like uh, Pablo Picasso. That is, I get a look at the same event from several different directions. Uh, and I have to try to make you know, a single portrait out of that, if you will. Uh, it's a real challenge, but it, it, it's also a lot of fun. Uh, and I think, you know, I finally figured out some things that confused me in the beginning. Uh, I don't make any claim to have made any great discoveries in here, but I think I've written a lot of this stuff in more detail than you would get it uh, in a standard historical account, uh, that you understand really what happened to Emma Cowan, for example, uh, than you would get in a, in a standard hi history of it, because I wanted to know where she was standing. I wanted to know what she was seeing. I, you know, talked, you know, about what must have been going through her head. Uh, the guarantee you make as a nonfiction writer is that everything you write down is going to be true in some way, and if not, uh, well labeled. So here and there I say, you know, Emma must have been thinking X, Y, Z. Uh, and I don't think in places where I make those conjectures, anybody's going to argue with me if you're surrounded by Indians and one of them has a gun pointed at your husband's head, it's probably reasonable to say she was frightened. Yes, I think so. <laughs> so who would, be the, uh, who would be the audience for this book? When I write my books, I think of people uh, touring in, in Yellowstone Park. That is, that's where my books sell, so that's what I think about. And I think about two kinds of readers there. One of them, I kind of, you know, that's, it's the uh, high school math teacher from Pittsburgh, uh, who is a smart guy and he's visiting the park for the first time. He runs across uh, the road signs talking about the capture and, and the Nez Perce going through the park and tells himself he'd like to find out a little more. So in the bookstore, he sees this book and picks it up. So he's a, an alert, smart guy who doesn't know much about the park or its history. And then I think of his, his, his cousin, a woman from Red Lodge, Montana, who's been to the park a dozen times and is an amateur historian. And I've got to really watch out that I don't make a factual error because she will know if I put the uh, Indians on the wrong side of the river or if I put uh, the geyser basins in the wrong order or what, whatever. So that's one answer is people who go through Yellowstone Park. The other thing is stuff we have alluded to already. Uh, they're good adventure stories. You know, I wrote, you know, if you want to know who do, who, do, who do I want to read this book, the answer is everybody. And I tried to write it so everybody could read it. Uh, you know, and I, like I say, I think, I think these are really rip-roaring adventures that anybody who wants to read an adventure story uh, can, can have fun with this. And I mean, from junior high kids on up, I think there's, there's stuff in here for everybody. Uh, I've mentioned Emma Cowan. If you, if you want a strong female character, you sure have one in here. The other really strong character in the book is, is Andrew Weikert, who is kind of the de facto head of the, um, of the Helena party. And Andrew, uh, goes out to find out if they're, if they're safe. They see the Indians, they go into hiding. Andrew goes out to, to find out if the Indians have gone on. Well, he's gone with, with one of his friends. The Indians attack the camp. So he gets back to find out that everybody has scattered. Um, he then goes to Mammoth Hot Springs where a number of his companions are, but two of them are missing. So he's the guy that says, I've got to go back and find my friends. Uh, so he's, a, he's a, a heroic figure in the sense that he's going to go risk his life because two young men in this party haven't shown up. Uh, and he runs afoul of the Indians again, has a nice blazing gun battle. Uh, so there's, so uh, I guess the question is who reads it? If you're interested in adventure stories with, uh, with heroes and gun battles, 
uh, it's for you. If you're a fan of um, Western history, particularly Yellowstone Park history, I think you're going to enjoy this book. Well, sounds like who wouldn't enjoy it? It's uh, you know, right out there. And, and accessible to um, down to a junior high level here. So, wait. Yeah, one of the things I do when I write is check the readability levels. And, you know, I, tr I try, to, try to hit about sixth to eighth grade in terms of vocabulary, sentence length, uh, because that's the way to go. And of course, I'm, I'm trained as a journalist, right? writing short, crisp, clear uh, sentences is a habit in the first place. That's just how I write. Well, a well-written story, uh, you know, at that level, I think uh, anyone would enjoy it. So, yes, very good. Well, I, I really appreciate the time you took here today to visit with us about your book and, and uh, share a little bit. Um, it's been fun. Yeah, it's been, it has been fun. been delightful to meet you and uh, get a chance to visit. So. Well, and I, I hope I get a chance to come over and promote my books at your shop. And, uh, well, if, if we don't like like this. Can these events, uh, you know, we'll set something up for you. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thanks, thanks Laura. Bye-bye. Bye. This program has been produced by This House of Books in collaboration with the High Plains Book Awards. The Book Awards were established to recognize regional authors and literary work that examines life on the High Plains. Nominations will be accepted starting in January 2021 on the website highplainsbookawards.org. Anything else you'd like to add at this point? Well, I could mention my other books. Um, okay. Uh, first book I put together was Adventures in Yellowstone. That's, a, that's an anthology of a dozen stories uh, that includes uh, Emma Cowan's story, uh, Andrew Weichert's story, uh, and several that you haven't heard of. Uh, and it, it covers that period from uh, the 1870s to 1915. Mm -hmm. So we're getting to the period when the park is pretty civilized. And that's, that's one thing. When I was doing book signings down at, down at Old Faithful, people kept asking for campfire stories, stories you could read in one sitting. Uh, and I said, well, I can do that. I mean, so I put together something called the Stories of Yellowstone. And that's the same kind of story, uh, a little longer time period. It begins with John Coulter's famous run, uh, kind of the earliest of, of the stories, uh, and goes, goes through about, well, till the introduction of cars in the park, 1915. Uh, and it's 72 stories. So these are stories that are 500 to 2,000 words. So you really could read them around the campfire in one sitting. Uh, when I was done with those, I had adventures that I didn't know what to do with. So I tried my hand at fiction, and that came out to be Megan's Perfect Shot, uh, which is a book aimed at about six, sixth graders. Uh, and uh, I self-published that, but it's a good little book. I'm proud of it. And then next fall uh, in November, Another anthology comes out uh, called Side Saddles and Geysers, which focuses on women's stories in the park. Okay. So that's, that's a topic uh, I've wanted to write about for a long time. And when I was cleaning up after, after finishing Encounters in Yellowstone, I said, aha, I, I now have in my collection enough good women's stories to make a book. Uh, 
So Encounters took me uh, years to put together. Uh, Side Saddles and Geysers um, was from, from idea to um, manuscript going off to the publisher was, was about four months. Um, you know, that's kind of an underestimate because that doesn't count the 15 years of collecting stories that were in my files. But going through my files and just assembling it didn't take me, did, that didn't take me long. So um, readers at this House of Books can look forward to, to that book. I think people are really going to like the, the uh, Side Saddles and Geysers book. Now that's coming next fall, not not uh, fall. That'll be that'll be November November twenty twenty.